working. Cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrea. I work for NVIDIA. And we today we talk about uh, kernel testing. How many of you are familiar with VirtMeNG or VirtMe? Oh, oh, not bad. <laughs> okay, at least my talk has a purpose. Uh, otherwise, it was just done. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, I have to show the disclaimer, whatever. Um, wh what is VirtMeNG? Um, so it's basically a tool that allows you to build and run kernels in a virtualized snapshot of your life system. And what it means is it's simply a, a script around QMU, but what it does, like instead of having a VM, I still have a VM, but for the file system, it mounts your host file system inside the guest in a read-only mode, and uh, you can do writes with overlay FS. That's it. So basically what you do, you can use, let's say you build your own custom kernel. Uh, you, can, you can literally run the kernel as if it was like a user space process, and you end up into a console that is an exact copy of your system. So it, like you have all your files, all your sessions, uh, but all the writes that you do are, are ephemeral. So basically you, you save the time that you usually need to like deploy VMs when you do kernel testing. And it's really fast, so it's really useful when you need to do like repetitive kernel testing such as, let's say you have a proof of concept for a CV, you need to run this across multiple kernels, or you need to bisect a bug. In that case, it's, I mean, it, it can help you to speed up your workflow. Um, it's derived from VirtMe, originally uh, written by Andy Lutomirsky. That's why I asked like, if you're familiar with VirtMeNG or VirtMe, because the original project was, uh, yeah, big kudos to, to Andy that did like initial work. Uh, but at some point, the project was unmaintained, so I, at some, and I was using it on a daily basis. I remember, like on GitHub, there was this giant amount of pull requests, like 20 pull requests that were sitting there. So I just created my fork, uh, and people started to use my version instead of the main one. So at some point, I, I wrote uh, an email to Andy Lutomirsky asking, like. Uh, what, what can we do? Can, can, I, can I continue maintaining this project? And he was like, yeah, sure, that's so more than happy to do that. So I ended up, people started to use mine, and I ended up being the maintainer of this, of this tool. Um, so what, what is not with me and G? Because sometimes people are like, oh, that's pretty cool. I want to run my production inside that. No, that's not, it's, it's not like Docker, it's not like, uh, Incus of Libvirt is not a virtualization manager. It's a tool explicitly designed for kernel development. So uh, you can do that, but it, it's not like probably it's not the right tool. Why you need VirtMeNG? So I've seen a lot of people using like custom scripts to test the kernel, um, and me included, initially I was used, I had my own QMU wrapper. Well, actually initially when I started kernel development, I was testing on my own laptop and I ended up like breaking the file system like multiple times. How many of you are, test, are doing kernel tests on a bare metal? Or I've done. Yeah, okay, that's, that's risky, unless you have a separate server. If you, you know, if you do tests on the same machine that you use for development, it's very convenient because you already have everything, but it's inconvenient if something goes wrong because you lose everything. So that was the main idea of VirtMeNG, like use your machine to test a kernel without the risk of breaking everything. And this gives you uh, the, the, the second point here. Where's the, I lost the, the okay, whatever, the laser pointer. Okay, yeah, the, the second point here, the lack of a fast edit compile test cycle that is something that we usually miss with kernel development. You know, you, 
you change something, then you need to recompile the kernel, then you need to boot a VM, and in, in the meantime, oh, thanks, Amanda. Yeah, I don't need that, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you know, and in the meantime, it's not like working with user space applications where you, you, know, you do a change, you just recompile, and you dot slash your application. Uh, so basically, this lack of uh, fast edit compile cycle tooling is something that motivated me a lot to invest in this project. Um, and there's also not a standard way, like again, many people are using their own scripting tooling around QMU and whatnot. Um, so how does it work? That is not rocket science, it's just a, a Python script uh, around, around QMU, KVM. Uh, it's using VirtaioFS and OverlayFS to mount the host file system inside the guest in read-only mode, and OverlayFS, of course, for the, to, in order to support the writes. There, everything is ephemeral, so the actual writes are happening in tempfs. So if you do a lot of writes, you end up using all the memory. Uh, but that's fine. It's supposed to be like you know. Quickly spin up an instance, do your test, and just kill everything, and collect the result. Uh, so recently, I've done some changes to uh, explore micro VM. Micro VM is a very lightweight uh, architecture in QMU that is it's optimized for boot time and light, uh, small memory footprinting. And one of the latest changes that I've done is to have like a, a custom in it. Uh, uh, that is called virdme and gnit uh, that is written in Rust. Uh, I, I picked Rust because I just wanted to learn Rust. <laughs> that's, that's the only reason. Uh, and, uh, but it ended up being a good choice because the, in virdme, the init script was in bash. That's good for portability. It's still in bash if you try to boot VMs on a different architecture, but like it's quite slow. So with the Rust implementation, it's, uh, you can get like a better boot time. That can be significant if you run, if you have, if you use VirtMeNG like in a CI CD environment where you have to massively run a massive amount of tests. So yeah, I'm going fast here because I want to show you some, some examples, but VirtaioFS is pretty cool. Not sure if you know it already. Is there anyone here that is working on VirtaioFS? No. Okay, because, yeah, I have a slide later that, that is interesting. Um, it's basically a way to share directories in general uh, within the, from the host into the guest or vice versa. Uh, basically, the directory that I share is a, a root by default. I share everything. Um, so in this way, like you have the, in the guest, you have the visibility of the exact image of the host. And it's cool because it uses Fuse, but the server part of Fuse is running on the host, and the communication happens using uh, Virtio. So it's really fast, like the metadata goes over Fuse, but the actual I.O. runs on the host natively. So that's why it's really fast. Um, and then, okay, yeah, I mentioned this already, overlay FS in order to be able to do writes. I, I don't have a single overlay, I have multiple overlays, uh, like one per, per user, etc, var, and whatnot. So you can, you can do everything, you can install packages, you can do all the tests that you want. Uh, one of the tests that I was showing at some presentation was like, I was reading my emails in, inside VirtMeNG, deleting all my emails just for, for the audience. <gasps> and then, and then for instance, instead you don't, you're not deleting anything because it's all ephemeral. Um, and, then, and then there's, okay, micro VM is just to gain some extra time for, uh, let's say, for, for, for boot time. Because um, it's like, it's minimal, there's no PCI, ACPI initialization. You can save a few milliseconds on, on boot time. And again, uh, the init part, so it, originally in VirtMe, it was a bash script. Now there's a Rust program that is compiled. Uh, so that's faster. Um, 
one thing is like, of course, like I mentioned, if you run VertBNG and you uh, want to test a different architecture than the one that you run on the host, uh, it's still using the bash version. That's something that I was planning to change, like provide multiple builds of VertBNG in it, uh, maybe the couple, the two projects, so that you, you can, for example, create a chi root uh, with the binaries for the other architecture and then uh, uh, you know, use VertBNG in it also for cross architecture. But it's something that needs to be done. It's not there yet. And, and this is a re recap uh, like of, so this is where uh, with the old style VertMe, that's the boot time. It's about 8.5 seconds. That is not that bad. The boot time means like booting the kernel and having a shell so that you can start to do something. Um, so it used to take 8.5 seconds from scratch. Then using VertIOFS basically uh, halved the, the, the time. Micro VM helped also like, and, and VertMeNG helped quite a lot. So now if you look here, we are below one second. And this, these tests are done on this tiny little laptop. Well, it, it's not, it's quite power, powerful, but it, I mean, it's a laptop system. So basically in less than a second, you can uh, boot a system, run a command. Oh, I didn't say that. Yes, the, the, the test is actually boot the kernel, uh, run a command, shut down the VM and collect the result. And all of that, all of this happens in less than a second. So it, it's quite useful if you, again, if you're using a CI CD environment, because you can quickly run tests really fast and, and collect results. And uh, yeah, that's the slide that I mentioned. Like, um, so in, in the boot time, moving to VirtioFS doesn't show, I mean, it, it, it's two, two times faster, but it's not dramatically faster. And instead, like, this is a, a time git diff on the Linux kernel source. So of course, uh, there's a lot of metadata and data involved in this, in this IO uh, operation. And it, it's fun because originally, uh, VertMe was using 9PFS. Uh, as soon as I moved to VertIOFS, I tried this test and I was like, oh my goodness, it's like, <laughs> that's really fast. It's to, to 300 times faster. So that's really, uh, it basically changed the, the purpose of VertMe because before it was like, okay, you can do a lot of tests, but don't try to do file system tests because it, everything is gonna be quite slow. Now, after moving to VertIOFS, uh, it, you can literally do any, you can even run file system benchmarks. Of course, you are going to, uh, you're not going to stress the file system, the, the, uh, an actual file system, you're going to stress test VertIOFS. But if you want to run stress test on the VFS layer or any kind of upper level file system, you, you can do that. Um, and that's, yeah, exactly. And so I was asking uh, if there was someone that is working on VirtIOFS because I think this one could be a, a nice benchmark to showcase on, <laughs> on their, their web page or, or similar. Uh, okay, questions so far? Yes, there's one there. Uh, so yeah, uh, do you think it could be interesting, and uh, maybe you already have this in VertMeNG, uh, to have a way to um, either exclude certain parts of your file system or add overlays? For example, say like I have some uh, pretty heavy system D services that run at boot and I would like to avoid running them every time I spin up the test VM. Is there a way to do that? Yeah, so that's really interesting. Uh, the answer is, I don't use, uh, you don't use systemd, so, <laughs> so that's why it's fast. That's fair. <laughs> no, I'm planning to support systemd at some point. Uh, right now, because you know, the goal is basically to have a tool for kernel development, uh, and the main target is for tests is like case of tests, you know, when you don't need many system services or demons. Uh, and that's why like VertMeNG in it uh, is, is that fast, not because it's Rust, not because it's, well, also because it's small, but mostly because it's not relying on anything else. It's just 
starting the bare minimum things so that your system is usable, uh, but then it's not, it, it doesn't support systemd. I actually have, and I'll show you later some slides, where you can pretend that systemd is running, so I can start certain applications that are quite complex without actually having systemd. But, but it, it, this, is, this doesn't mean that, like, I don't have to exclude portions of the file system for that, because I'm, I have, I mean, I have my own custom init script, so I know what, what I need to run. I mean, the file system can be everything, and then, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes, there's another question in the back. Uh, so, does using uh, micro VMs have limitations on what can be virtualized and what cannot? Uh, you already mentioned limitations of PCI, but are there any limitations on, for example, networking or something like that? There, there's pretty much everything. Uh, of course, if you want to do like PCI test, that, that you don't have that. Uh, in general, if you need to test specific hardware, it's better to not use uh, micro VM. In fact, there's an option uh, dash dash disable micro VM uh, when, you, when you need it. Um, but like you have, let's say you have networking, you have graphic, you have even sound if you want. So you, you have a bunch of other, like the, the, the guys that, that provided the micro VM did a really good job. And everything is like, the bus is always virtio. So everything is also pretty fast, like, uh, yeah. Got Thanks. Other questions? Okay. Let's keep going. So what, what, what can I do with build me and G? I, I wanted to show you some examples because usually when I present this tool, I go through the whole story and at some point it's a little boring. So let's go with some examples. Uh, one of them is the build time because it, it's not just about running Actually, the original design for this tool was to focus more on the build time. It was supposed to be kind of a, a make a lo local mode config, but for KVM. So you can use like a VNG dash B or dash dash build, and I'm, I'm using an external host here to build the kernel. What VNG does, it generates a very minimum config uh, that has everything you need so that you can spin up an instance and use the instance inside KVM. Uh, if I, so once, uh, Steve, is Steven here? Steven, oh, yeah, there you go. So once Steven told me one of the most impactful contribution to the kernel that he has done is make local mode config. And I agree because, you know, it allows people to quickly test a bunch of kernels. Again, it's the same fast edit. I'm, I'm stealing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stealing Stephen talks. No, no, but it's something that we usually usually discourages a lot of people. Like you say, oh yeah, you need to recompile the kernel. Now you need to install the kernel in a VM. Now you need to reboot. And like I, sometimes I work with students. They're like, okay, no, I, I can do that. Even if it's just, you know, you give them the commands to do that, they're just like, okay, no, give up. If you show them something like this, they're like more willing to try at least. And then it's, it, it's really easy. And okay, now I'm using a, like an external builder that is beefy enough, but I still, you know, still I need like uh, one minute and a half to, to build a kernel and uh, um, yeah, there's not the time here, but it's pretty instantaneous, like one second to get into the kernel. So in one minute and a half, uh, I can recompile the kernel. And w when you build on an external host, what it's doing is like it's doing a git push on the remote host, it's building, then it doesn't sync everything back, it's only syncing the binary artifacts that you need. So the, let's say you are on, on x86, uh, you get the bz image, the .ko files, and the bare minimum modules stuff so that you can load modules uh, in the kernel. So, yeah, the boot is also pretty fast. Like I was saying, we are uh, we were able to break the one second limit for fun. Because <laughs> one sec, like uh, at some point we got to like two seconds uh, in uh, in an average machine on, on laptops mostly. 
And uh, we were like, okay, now I think there's just no reason to optimize the boot time even more, but now we're under one second. That's really cool. Um, again, running KSL test is one of the ideal use cases for this tool. Uh, in this case, you know, I'm, I am in a, in a Git repository. Uh, so that's the new syntax for those that are familiar with the old one. Like you do dash dash and everything that is after is executed inside the guest. So you can literally, I have recompiled the kernel. I can literally run VNG dash dash any command and everything that you see down here is executed inside the guest. Uh, and again, in 11.57 seconds, I can run the Futex uh, KSL test. That it, it's the same time that it takes to run this command on my host. Uh, so it, the, the feeling is like, okay, I can run this kernel with this command as if I was running it on the host. That's the idea, that's the goal of the tool. So for example, this is my typical LKML workflow. Uh, I see a patch and I'm like, okay, I wanna test this patch. So I, I used before, how many of you are familiar with before Shazam? That's great, it's amazing. So you pass the link, it's just applying the patch, so it downloads the patch and applies the patch to your current tree. It's, so it's funny because, okay, it needs one, uh, uh, 0 0.93 seconds to apply the patch and, and 0 0.98 to test the, the cursor. Okay, of course in between there's a kernel build, but testing the kernel with uname-r takes uh, as much time as applying the patch. I, I think that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I mean, considering that usually I had to uh, spin up a VM, uh, install the kernel, copy packages, uh, and whatnot. Um, so, yeah. Other things that you can do, uh, being a script around QMU, of course, gives you the flexibility to do anything that you can do with QMU. There's nothing special, it's just, uh, it, it either supports some options in a uh, syntax similar to QMU, but there's also a dash dash QMU PTS option where you can just pass a bunch of QMU options that will be just passed to the, the QMU underneath. Uh, so yeah, you, as sometimes I use, well, actually often, I use this to simulate different CPU topologies that's really, uh, it's really good for testing scheduling stuff, for example. In this case, I created uh, four CPUs uh, with two threads, uh, two cores, so two, two cores per, per um, two threads per socket. I can test like SMP, non-SMP, and whatnot. And yeah, and you can see down here, it reflects on uh, LS CPU. I can simulate memory topology, so I can create multiple NUMA nodes. So this is, this is actually odd and tricky because I have like one gig, a NUMA of one gig with CPU zero, one, and three, and three gig with CPU two, four, and four, five, six, seven. It's like totally hybrid, heterogeneous, but this is also useful to do tests on, uh, yeah, for scheduling as well, but memory, whatever. Um, another cool thing is pipeline, because again, I wanted to give the feeling that you were running the command on the host. So I spent quite some time to do, to use like the, the Vertio console that are connected to the standard input, standard output, standard error. So basically you can say command, pipe, virtmng, it sends the command down the the Vertio console and the command that it runs inside the guest receives the standard input for, from the host and everything that it spits into standard out, you receive that on the host. So here, for example, I, I specify a command, lscpu, I pipe that to bash that runs inside the guest, I take the output and I pipe that to the standard in input of CalSA. So that's the, uh, the output of LS CPU inside the guest. 
the command has been it was specified on the host, and uh, the cow is is running on the on the host as well. Um, so yeah, well, basically, okay, this is a silly example, but if you use this in your CI CD, I mean, you can concatenate different things. You can put everything in a pipe, uh, uh, in a pipeline, and uh, yeah, sometimes it can be useful. And you can even go crazy with that. So, so this, this beast up here is basically running uh, one, two, three, four, five, se seven instances uh, with seven different kernels. And everything is running in, in pipe, so the output of the previous one is going into the input of the next one, and everything is concatenated all the way to the end where it's doing the cow say. And so all of these run in uh, less than five seconds. So I tested, let's, let's say this uname dash har is a, uh, is a CVE proof of concept. Like that can be quite useful to see if, uh, you know, or you're doing a bisect. Can be useful to do, to test CVEs, for example. Where, where's Greg? There he is, yes, it, okay. <laughs> Message said. Um, yeah, and oh, another thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, so these are not these are pre-compiled kernels. It's not actually compiled the kernel. But if you specify uh, a main line tag, uh, what WordMeNG is doing is actually downloading the kernel from the Ubuntu mainline builds, because Ubuntu is constantly building mainline kernels as soon as a new tag is released, and they upload these kernels are as deb on a, on a public uh, server. Uh, Ubuntu is not officially supporting that. They're, they're just for testing purposes. Because, you know, sometimes uh, you want to say to customer support, try this upstream kernel to see if it's an Ubuntu bug or uh, an up, a mainline bug. So I'm, I'm actually using, reusing their own thing to, for me and G. But it, it's really fast. Like, you can say, oh, let's see. Is this bug happening on uh, RC2 as well, or RC1 as well? So in a few se of course, it needs to download the kernel, but it, yeah, and this, in this case, it was already pre-downloaded, of course, but still, it, it, it's quite fast. Um, and you can also, again, it's a wrapper around QMU, so you can do all the fancy QMU things. You can do debugging, if you start with dash dash debug, uh, it opens the GDB uh, port. So let's say you crash the kernel uh, on another shell, you just run BNG dash dash GDB and it will attach to the previous BNG instance and it shows you what, what happened here. Um, you can use Dragon as well, uh, so you can generate a dash dash dump, you can generate a crash dump, where you can either use crash or, or dragon. I, yeah, I, and any, are you familiar with dragon? The meta people, for sure. How many of you are familiar with dragon? Okay, yeah, dragon is, is a kind of a, a debugger. Uh, it's a Python uh, environment. It's a programmable debugging environment. And it's pretty cool. You can either attach to a, uh, you can either use like a, core dump, or you can attach to proc core live and inspect, uh, inspect the kernel. Uh, in this case, for example, I am uh, printing the GIFs from this, uh, from this cache crash dump. And uh, yeah, here shows like the current GIFs. And it's totally programmable. It's actually pretty cool. So that's something that I, um, I've integrated this well, so because you need some special options to generate a crash dump that is compatible with Dragon. So, uh, if it doesn't work, uh, use the latest version of WordMe and GN. It should should work. Another thing that you can do, you can run uh, graphical applications. Um, so it's not just running console tests. You can potentially start, for example, in this case, I am starting GLX Gears and it opens a window where you can, uh, uh, yeah, but if you need to test a graphical application, of course, it's not like, 
I'm working on PCI pass through and GPU pass through. So uh, once that's done, I'm, I'm hoping to receive some patches from some contributors. Once that merge, we should be able to do uh, graphical testing in a more advanced way. But so far, I mean, it's still working if you need to do basic GUI testing. Um, and of course, you can push more on this. <laughs> you can, yeah, you can recrawl people in a creative way. Now, you can actually run YouTube. So if you run this command, uh, what it's doing, uh, it's creating a, like a fake X server. And you can run Firefox. Uh, uh, with a URL, and with, uh, did I put dash dash sound? Oh yes, here. If you put dash dash sound inside the guest, it will start a pipe wire, so you can also test sound if you want. I, I mean, I'm sure it is just for fun, but I think nobody is <laughs> actually using this option. But it's there, I mean, you never know. Sometimes you may actually want to test sound, because for I don't know, for reasons, uh, it's possible. And of course, uh, uh, like if you need to access YouTube, you need to start the network, because otherwise it won't work. Uh, and it's funny, like if you close Firefox, it just shut down everything, because it's that's just a single application. Uh, I, I mean, we can stress this even more and be even more brave and Try to play video games inside BirmiNG. There's actually a video on the, uh, the GitHub page where that's showing that I'm actually playing this game. Maybe, maybe we can do a demo if there's time. But you can start Steam. Uh, yeah, that is it. I'm starting Steam. Uh, I, okay, I need to disable micro VM, not for special reasons, but just because the, my trackpad isn't working. I, I don't know, it's something that I need to investigate, but uh, just because of that, because everything else, uh, it works uh, in the micro VM. So again, even if you enable micro VM, uh, I, it's pretty powerful. You can let that, the other question from before. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty fire, powerful. You have support for a, a bunch of many different things. Um, so that said, I mean, it, Everything is, um, you can do fancy things and what, and what not, uh, but the main focus recently, like I see that the, the way that we're we are moving toward like uh, a tool to be used in a CI CD uh, environment. Uh, I know, like, so for example, of course, SCADEX, we are using uh, VirtMeNG in our uh, CI CD pipeline. We have, um, a bunch of uh, tests uh, uh, configure a GitHub, GitHub Actions. So every time that, let's say, we create a pull request, um, what happens is like we use BirdMeNG to, uh, it, to build a minimal kernel, run a, minim a minimal kernel, and actually test every single scheduler that we have in the user space uh, SCADEX repository with a workload of stre uh, stress ng that is running inside the guest. Yes, Steve? Uh, microphone? Is it on? Okay. Yeah. So, first of all, are you familiar with KTest PL? What? Say, say it again? K? KTest PL. Is it the, uh, yeah, your KTest in, the, in, in three, tools, right? Testing KTest PL. Yes. So it looks like it'd be a nice complement to this. Uh, reason why is because you create standard scripts, .config files, and just do ktest config, and it takes in standard input, standard output. It could parse it. It could tell you. It could you know you could do searches on it for commands. So this looks like something you just create a bunch of scripts for, and then just like hey, I want to do a test and kick it. It'll kick off a you know a hundred different you know your VNG tools to give you a result for kind of like so anyone could do this. You don't have to be like any, it's pretty simple script. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah that's interesting. It could be, you mean, it could be integrated with, with K-Test. That's it's, what you mean? It would be trivial to do it. I don't know. Greg, mm -hmm. do you still use K-Test? I do. Yeah, so. Yeah, great, and, great. but so the last time that I looked at K-Test, uh, it's like, it, so it, there's, no, there's no virtualization integration, but you it, can 
you it's, can yes. specify commands, right? Right. What you would do is this looks like something. So basically, it doesn't supply what you're supplying. Mm -hmm. It purposely doesn't supply what you're supplying. What basically is, it's a framework to say, I want to run like 20 different tests. You have to supply what it's going to do, and it, it could pass them. It could, it could do bisects. It could do a bunch of things. Yeah, that that's something that I so, something we have to talk to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something that it's worth exploring. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, thanks for mentioning. Yep. Heads up. Uh, so yeah, I was saying is like in, in Skill Exit, we, we we run this inside. Um, we create guests. Uh, we run stress ng. We run the schedulers to check if we have regressions. The cool thing is that everything runs inside. Docker inside a GitHub action. So it's like we don't even, uh, if you see these in a generic way, basically you can use this tool to test any application with any kernel inside a, a GitHub action. And that's pretty powerful, not only for kernels, like you may have, you know, I may have an application you want to check. How does it work like in the Fedora kernel? Or how does it work in the Ubuntu? Low latency kernel. How does it work? In the, you can like either compile or grab kernels because um, something that I haven't mentioned. You can also pass like a kernel binary uh, if you have the modules. It will try to figure out where you have the modules, um, and yeah, do do test with precompiled kernels as well. Um, and an interesting thing. So yeah, another uh, use case is the. Uh, the NetDev guys moved to MeNG for their CI/CD. Uh, oh yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't finish with. with so with SCADEX, uh, I remember once we moved to the CI/CD to MeNG, we triggered like I don't remember, but I think that, that David here probably remembers. We, we triggered like uh, ten or, or, or twenty different bugs just by changing environment and have it having this like virtualized environment. So it was very effective like to set up this, this testing because you know sometimes you test on bare metal, you test in VMs and whatnot. Uh, uh, that, that's like a good opportunity to provide like a, such a peculiar environment and trigger bugs by testing in this unusual, uh, unusual environment, unusual setup. Uh, Another thing that surprised me is uh, is Matter, so the the graphical thingy. Uh, apparently, they're using VirtMeNG to test Matter with different kernels. They're using the, the the scenario that I was describing earlier, where you have like, uh, um, yeah, you have your application. It, it's not for kernel testing, but it for it's to test applications with different kernels. That's another use case that I haven't told about, but people came up to me saying, oh yes, we use that for, for this kind of, of, of testing. Um, oh, another thing that surprised me that I haven't mentioned in the slides is there are people that are using um, uh, VirtMeNG to test webcams. So that's quite unusual because I was like, uh, how do you test webcams? Well, being a QMU at the end, you just need to pass the USB inside the guest, and then you can just have, you know, if you have web, webcams plugged in, you can test them. So if you have, like, doing regression testing on webcams, that's another use case uh, of VirtMeNG. That's quite uh, unusual. Um, yeah, let's see. So, yeah. The conclusion is, I'm hoping to, with this tool, like I was using this tool for me, just for me, because uh, I was doing, for a while, I was doing a lot of kernel bisects, and it was so painful. <laughs> uh, so I decided to, yeah, spend some time to write my own scripting, uh, my own scripts around with me, and doing some optimizations. And at some point, I was like, okay, why don't I merge everything in VirtMe and I release that? Also because VirtMe was unmaintained, and I was so sad about that because I was using uh, that on a daily basis. But, you know, that's, that's the beauty of open source. If you really, really, really need something, 
at least there's the code, you can get the code, and uh, you modify, uh, and maybe someone else is start to use your changes, and uh, yeah, you create a new project. Um, so yeah, lowering the barrier of kernel development is something that is like, is literally the mission of this tool, and, and also, you know, the providing the fast edit, compile, run uh, iterations. Uh, the third one is an ambitious project, but it would be cool, uh, and, and maybe what Steven mentioned could be a way, like try to integrate this with more upstream tooling, uh, it, so that it could become something more standard among the, the Linux kernel community. Uh, and, you know, the last one, last but not least, uh, that seems to be the biggest, like, use case, the most common use case for Bird Me and G nowadays is the uh, CI, CD scenario, where you want to do, like, quick tests, uh, put them in a pipeline, automate and collect the results in a scriptable way. Uh, so that, that's, right now, that's the main focus for the project. Um, future, future plans, uh, so yeah, the, the V, so, so right now one of the issues that is not, is not an issue for me, but for someone that a lot of people have been asking me to implement multiple consoles, because right now you just have one console, so if I need to do something you know, and in parallel with something else, basically what I do, I start Tmux uh, and, I, and I create multiple sessions inside Tmux. Uh, but having a way to um, kind of SSH into the, the, the VM or spawn a console from another shell, it would be very convenient. You can use SSH, but you need to do a, quite some tricks because not having system D, uh, you, you need to do some ma manual starting. It can be automated, but at some point, I mean, it would be just nice to have the, the VSOC console where you can just run out. So so cat command or something similar, and that's that's a work in progress. Supporting system D is uh, it's more complicated because it uh, you know the boot time is great, but if we move to system D, it would be quite slow. So that will be optional for sure, and it's not trivial because once you fork your host system you have like your host system D status also in the guest. So if you try to start system D, it's like, it's crashing and complaining because it finds a system D that is already running, basically, even if it's not really running, but you find the files there. So we need to hide some files, hide the sessions, and figure out a way to start like another system D inside the guest, hiding the host part. It's, but it's something at some point I want to, to explore and, and see. Um, so yeah, another thing is like right now, it, it's possible to, of course, virtualize the entire file system of your host, uh, only a, a directory like a chi root. Uh, it doesn't still support like passing a QCOW2 image and say, use this as the main file system. That should be trivial. And that maybe that's the way to support system D because maybe I can just boot the QMU and be happy with that. Because um, if you need systemd, maybe you need to run more complicated tests. So at this point, it's just better to have like a, a separate QCOW2 file and not mess up too much with the uh, with VirtioFS and the, the loopback mounts or similar. Uh, and yeah, last, uh, a few other things that are in the to-do to -do list. Uh, and that they're interesting because being in, in NVIDIA, of course, the GPU pass-through is now one thing that I want to focus on. Uh, I'm already working on that. It, it's easy at some point, we just need to figure out the right, the right QMU options, but I, I want to make it in a, in a nice and usable way. Uh, that would open like a more uh, detailed testing for, for graphical stuff. Uh, yeah, confidential computing is another thing that uh, it, mostly for testing, not to run confidential computing on, on VNG instances, of course, just, you know, to test confidential computing. Testing confidential computing would be the target. And, yeah, secure boot, I don't know. It ends up, I mentioned this in, in every presentation about VNG, 
hoping that someone will come up with a patch, but uh, it's still, still in the to-do list. No one has done that yet, but we'll see at some point that we, we will have that. Uh, yeah, I put some reference in the slides and that, that's it. If you have questions. Don't be shy. Yes. Assuming it would be possible to specify a different route, is it possible to uh, boot a different ar architecture? Yes, you can. You can, of course, if you boot a different architecture, you can't virtualize your host file system because of the binaries or we, we just, everything would just crash Definitely. and explode. But you can pass, like, if you create a, a G root, for example, a separate directory with, with all the binaries, you can say dash dash root that directory. And that would be the thing that is virtualized inside the guest. So, yes. Okay, so that can be convenient for uh, occasional development on uh, uh, different architectures, for example, because as you explained, you find other tools on them. And uh... Oh, yes, yes. They, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that, because so another thing that has been suggested in the pro for the project, uh, someone at some point said, why don't you guys provide a way to, let's say, um, easily set up a development environment for the Linux kernel development on macOS, for example, or Windows? Because, you know, it's QMU, so as long as QMU runs, it's possible. And as long as you have, like, a, a chi root or a separate directory with all the development environment, so, yeah, it's, it's possible. It, it's something that it would be interesting to look at, like, providing a quick way to have, like, you, you get this tool and you can do kernel development on macOS or Windows or, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Have you thought about integrating this with Podman or Docker so that we could uh, start, let's say, a container and then run different kernels with that container? So the uh, well, the, the only integration that is we had to pet to patch something, but now you can run Docker and run virtme ng inside Docker and select different kernels because uh, because you know the Docker allows you to create containers, but the kernel is still the same. It's the, the lightweight virtualization. So you can't change kernel with Docker. But within the container, you can change kernel using virtme-ng. So you have this, you know, multiplexing of like, okay, I create a container, and then I virtualize the container, and I pick this kernel, and I test, and I test this. I'm not sure if I answered your, your question, but okay, more. We, we, can, we can talk about this offline, yeah. Um, can I access the guest boot logs when virtme is booting a kernel? Yes, so, oh, thanks, that's a good question. Uh, yes, so the, if you pass dash dash verbose or dash v, you get the whole kernel boot, and on the host, you can actually get the output as standard error. So if you say like uh, vng dash dash verbose, you run some command, uh, and you like you redirect the standard error into a file, you will have the kernel log uh, like the message and boot message message on in a file. Okay. So yeah. Thank you. In the back. Yeah, do you also have some kind of automated GDB facilities? For debugging, also to automatically attach GDB and get everything working. Yeah, there there was this. Um, yeah, there's a dash dash debug option that starts like the GDB port, uh, and with VNG dash dash GDB, it basically runs GDB with target remote that port, localhost that port. Okay. So you, as long as you have the VM Linux uh, file, you can also see the symbols and. Oh, okay. And but it's basically two commands, you know, you run yeah, dash dash yeah. debug and uh, yeah. And it, oh yeah, and one thing, it also disable casual because if you have address randomization, debug is pointless. Oh, and not pointless, but yeah. Um, 
When you were showing the video game with Steam, I guess this was using software rendering and not GPU rendering? Correct. Yeah, in fact, that's why I'm running Baldur's Gate 1, uh, Yeah, because of from, from far away, I thought it was Baldur's Gate 3. I was like, whoa. Okay. No, 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 it's one. Okay. Who played Baldur's Gate 1? You guys are young. Okay. <laughs> uh, another question following that is, uh, if you enable GPU pass-through, would that work only for GPU or any PCIe device? For example, for networking development, I could use that for... Yeah, I, I say the GPU pass through, but actually I, I care about uh, PCI pass through so that we can use like a better networking, uh, better, better anything is in, in PCI. Yes, yeah. okay. thank you. Thanks. Uh, does it work on um, uh, ARM64 laptop? You mean the, the host on ARM64? Yeah. Mm, okay, I'm trying to remember because at some point someone mentioned that. Uh, I honestly don't remember what was the result. <laughs> but I, I think so. I mean, as long as you can run uh, QMU, uh, yeah, I don't see why it, it won't work. Because like, at the end, VNG is nothing special. It's just a Python script that runs QMU with multiple options and sets up everything so that you have these this different capabilities like in, a, in an easy way. So I, I would say yes. If it doesn't, please report an issue on the GitHub page. That, that's it. it it's, where is the GitHub? GitHub page? Yeah, here at the top. Okay, thanks. Over there. Whoa. Oh, sure. What was it for? Uh, just on, on that, some of the ARM64 laptops don't provide um, support for hypervisor due to firmware limitations, so you'd have to run with TCG and the resulting performance impact. Okay. Uh, say, say it again, last, last part. Uh, so, so you'd have to run yeah, QAMU in TCG mode uh -huh. rather than for actually virtualizing. So uh, you'd have the performance overhead of uh, fully emulating. Oh yeah, yeah. That like, see, yeah. The, the overhead is um, exactly. You still have a, a emulation overhead in that case, I guess. Yeah. 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 But but, but um, that that's only some of the laps. So some laptops do have high, the hypervisor yeah. enabled. It's just mm -hmm. it's, it's just something to watch out for if you've got um, one of the uh, ones from the vendor who likes to lock things down. Done. Done. Thank you so much, everyone.